Amen. If you have a copy of God's Word, I invite you to turn to Psalm 127. Book of Psalms 127. You know, kids can say the cutest things or all depend on where you're at in life. The kid could just be about anybody. Children. How about that? Children can say the cutest things sometimes. And then those that, children that are, are related to us, we even say they're, they're, they are the cutest. But, but children say some of the cutest things. And I don't know about, maybe it's just because children are just honest. They're innocent. I don't may sometimes they're just brutally honest. But but when children speak, some some of the things that, that come out of their mouths are, are so cute and, and how they, they look at God. And we see that in uh, some of these children, uh, there are some children that wrote a letter to God and listen to what they had to say. Dear God, I went to this wedding the other day and they kissed in church. Is that okay? Dear God, if you watch in church on Sunday, I'll show you my new shoes. Dear God, please send Dennis Clark to a different camp next year. How about this one? Dear God, maybe Cain and Abel would not kill each other so much if they had their own rooms. It works with my brother. There may be some truth to that one. Dear God, please, please put another holiday between Christmas and Easter. There's nothing good in there now. God, thank you for that baby brother. But I prayed for it, a puppy. Dear God, I, I think about you sometimes, even when I'm not praying. Ooh, but how true is that statement sometimes? Children are a gift from God. And we make a mistake many times that children are ours. When we stop to think about it, God has entrusted children to our care. And what we are called to do is to be good stewards. And that in the way we train and the way we teach and in the way we exemplify, it gets to a point in life where we release. And our job is to have them prepared for them to follow the Lord. And we see all through Scripture just how important uh, children are. And I want us to look at this morning that the children are a heritage of God. In Psalm chapter 127. Solomon writes, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman walketh but in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat bread of sorrows, for so he giveth his beloved sl uh, sleep. Lo, children are a heritage of the Lord and the fruit of the womb is his reward as arrows are in the hand of a mighty man so are children of the youth happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them they shall not be ashamed but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate children are a heritage of god now that word heritage really means gift. 
But you know what? Society looks at children in a whole different way. There's many times society will say they're an inconvenience. And if they're an inconvenience, what do we do? We just snuff them out. Society says, let them fend for their own. And that's exactly what they do when, when fathers aren't in the place where they ought to be, when mothers don't care. They just fend for their own. And, and they learn from what they see. But we see in Scripture, though, that, that children are a heritage. They're a, if they are a gift from God, guess what? That shows just how important children are to God. What did Jesus say concerning children? If you don't come to him as a child, what? You won't experience the kingdom of God. There is a time where Jesus had, had, had a child on his lap. And his disciples, his church members, did what? Stop bothering him. He has more important things to do. And what did Jesus say? Hey, you leave them alone. This is what it's all about. And so listen, if we see children important to God, children must be important to us. As we continue our, our series in, in family matters, children are a matter of the family. Children are important to the family. Children experience all kinds of things in the family. And, and the things that, that, that children experience uh, in, in life, if they don't have that, that family structure, they're going to try to make decisions based on what they think sounds good to them. Guess what Satan's going to do? He's going to make sure that there are things that sound good to them that will absolutely destroy their life. But God gives children. Children are a part of, of everyday life. They're a gift so that we can pour into them and they continue what God has called each and every one of us Society says they're not a gift. Society will even say they can be an inconvenience. But I think many times, if we're not careful, we treat children as an inconvenience. I want us to see three things this morning with this text concerning children being a heritage of god number one is this is that we must depend on god look what look what uh solomon says in verse one except the lord build the house they labor in vain who build it when it comes to our families when it comes to our children there must be a dependence on god solomon says if there's someone that knows what Life can look like being wrecked. Solomon knew, knows this. Unless God is the one that builds it, everything's going to be in vain. We, we try so hard to build whatever in our, our reputations, our family, our business. We have an idea of, oh, I'm going to build this church. Listen, if God's not a part of it, none of it's going to work. And Solomon hits the nail on the head. It, God must be the one that builds it. He says, unless God builds the wall, guess what? It's not going to be uh, defended. I read a preacher who uh, had mentioned uh, in a sermon series on marriage, at the end of service, he gave out a small wooden cross to each 
married couple. And the preacher said, uh, put this cross in, in, a, in the room where you fight the most. Take this cross and, and put it in, in the room where you fight the most, and it will remind you of God's commands so you don't argue as much. One lady came up to him after the service. Quietly said, uh, you better give me five. You know, we laugh at that. You know, it is funny, it's okay, but listen, it reminds us of a, of a deeper truth that many Christian families, many so-called believing families are in trouble because we are building our families on something other than God. And allowing God to work in and through our lives. Dennis Rainey with Family Life out of Little Rock. A few years ago, did a survey and collected over 10,000 responses from local churches. Now, he didn't go, they didn't go out in the world and just go door to door. This is local churches that, that uh, did a survey. And the statistics that came back were alarming. Less, listen, less than half of the Christian couples said they had a good marriage. 58% said their marriages were in trouble. Folks, these are church people. These are people that we would consider just like us. 58% said their marriage were in trouble. 43% of those marriages were in a so-called yellow light area with signs of trouble. 15% of those surveyed were in a red light area with serious trouble headed for divorce. Listen, unless the Lord builds the house they that labor will labor in vain listen folks we're not immune to the things of the world when we look at it that way that god must build listen that the children that he has entrusted to us it's imperative that we allow the builder to be the one that's in charge. And I look at marriage this way. You look at marriage as a triangle. You have a, you have a top and, and it goes, to, you have the two sides that come to the bottom and across. And God at the top and, 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 and a husband and wife at the, each corner. Now what happens when they start moving closer to God? they naturally start moving closer to each other. And folks, that, that is what a, our, our relationship, our house ought to look like. When we move closer to God, we move closer to each other. And the things that, that we see in this world, we have an opportunity to battle against because we're closer to the one who can take care of it. But when we're farther away, there's going to be issues. And it doesn't just affect, oh, it just affects my wife, it just affects me. No, it affects the whole family. And when families are affected, guess what else is affected? Churches are affected. Family matters within the, the family or family matters within the church. You can't have a church without what? Families. We see all through Scripture what God thinks about family. We see how the church is set aside or designed as a family. Folks, there must be an absolute 
dependency on God. We get so busy in our life that, that we get so independent. We're going to do it my way. I'm going to do what, what I want, how I say, what I think. And we get so independent uh, of the one source, the one, the one power, the one that enables us to, to, be, to be a part of a home that honors and glorifies God. We get so independent that we get far away from that and we try on our own and, and we see how that gets us constantly in turmoil. When we get away from God, anything goes and it doesn't work that way work that way we, we make our decisions based on what i think we 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 pick pieces out of scripture and, and we, we we tweak it you know it is so it's really easy to, to tweak isn't it we, we can take one or two verses and we can tweak it and make it whatever we want it to to, to benefit me And when God isn't number one, homes suffer. And when homes suffer, children suffer. Not only do we must, we must depend on God, as Solomon writes, but we must defend the gifts of God. Look what he says. He talks about... Unless God, Lord, keeps the city, the watchman waketh, but in vain. There's a whole picture here of being uh, defended by what was, on that, what was on the outside of the city. It was the walls. Who was on the top? It was the watchman. Not only must we depend on God, but we must de de defend the gifts of God. Our families, the families are under a constant attack today. You realize that? How families were looked at years ago is different than the way families are looked at today. All across the board, there is nothing really in place to steer families in the right direction except the teachings of God's Word. Look what society does. We have liberal politicians. We have runaway judges. We have media elites that have, social, have a social and moral uh, worldview. And, and because of, they want to uh, flood everything with, with that, road, that, that, that worldview that is radically opposed to the Word of God. And under God, we are to be the watchmen of our families, the watchmen of our communities, uh, of our nation. And for that to happen, we must be committed to the character of God. And how do we do that? God wants us to intercede. We find in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 1, I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications and prayers and intercessions and giving of thanks be made what? for all men. The day we can't just afford to just sit and not take part. God tells us that through his word, we are to intercede in prayers for all men. The ones we like. And then guess what? God commands us to pray for those that we dislike. He says, for kings and for all that are in authority that we may lead a, a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto, what? unto a knowledge of the truth. God's sole purpose is that man will be saved. And everything that is involved to bring mankind to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ through his people, through his families, through his churches, that is the purpose. 
is that people will know the Lord. And you know what we find out? There are still people that need the Lord. We still have a job to do. And we must intercede. One of the things we must do is to intercede, but not only just intercede. Too many times we're just like an ostrich. You know what an ostrich does when they're in fear? Boy, they plop their head down in the, in the ground, don't they? You know, we, we, we act like ostriches many times. Listen, as churches, we kind of out of sight, out of mind. I come, I do my thing, I go home and not pay attention to what's going on around us. Yet scripture says we must defend. What scripture say about what is real religion? Taking care of the widows and the orphans keeping ourselves blameless or spotless in the world society is attacking god's heritage one in four american women under the age of 45 this comes from hope pregnancy center all right, right here in our city, one in four American women under 45 will have an abortion. When they, okay, that, that's the world. Listen, the next disclaimer is this. There's no distinction between church and unchurched. 19 or 2017, 862,300 abortions took place in America. 2019, 4,244 abortions took place in Oklahoma. An abortion is carried out every 89 seconds in a planned parenthood facility. Taxpayer funding has increased with $1.7 million taxpayer dollars every day going to support abortion facilities. Here in Oklahoma, we, we think right smack in the middle we're, we're, we're part of the Bible Belt. Uh, you know, this is where, where God resides. We, we don't have to worry about the East. We don't have to worry about the West. We're right here in the middle, and, and, and God is just blessing us. And here in Oklahoma, there are five abortion clinics. Two right here in Tulsa. I mentioned before, just south, uh, at 30, off of 32nd place, there's an abortion clinic just right south of the church. That is good and evil battling lives that are snuffed out. Why? Because the world says uh, heritage from God is an in inconvenience. The Planned Parent, the, the um, my mind just went blank. Plan, yeah, Planned Parenthood facility on Peoria has just not too long ago remodeled and added an uh, abortion clinic to, to that clinic too right here in Tulsa. And we have a choice. Oh, our children, uh, this is a family matter. Our children, a heritage of God. Or are they an inconvenience? What does God say? In Proverbs chapter 6, we're told that God hates the shedding of innocent blood. In Deuteronomy chapter 27 and verse 25, Cursed be he that taketh reward to slay an innocent person. You know, based, depending on if it's your, your baby or not. To you, they may be the, the most cutest thing around. And if it's yours, it is the cutest thing. You may look at someone else and like, I'm glad they grow. Maybe that cuteness will come one day. 
But here's the thing. There is not anything, anyone more innocent than a baby created in the image of God. And as Solomon said, they are a heritage. They are a gift. And we need to defend. You see, society says human beings are a cosmic accident. Incredible byproducts of blind evolutionary process. And see, then, and because of if you if you ascribe any kind of value to human life, it's arbitrary, it's tentative, it's self-centered. Listen, anything goes when it comes to humanity in their eyes. Convenience and control. But what does the Bible say on the hand? It teaches that human beings, like all creation, were created for the purpose of, of glorifying God. They're created with a distinct and unique capacity to know, to revere, to worship, and to glorify the Creator. He made human beings, male and female. God, and here's the other thing. God isn't a confused Creator. Amen? God isn't a confused... He made male and He fe made female in His own image. In His own good pleasure. In His own sovereign purpose. That purpose is for them to grow in, in, in the knowledge of Christ, to go forth and preach the gospel, claiming Jesus to a lost and dying world. The Lord's heritage has a purpose, just like each and every one of us has a purpose. That God calls us to intercede and to gather information, but God calls us to be involved. See, we can't be out of sight, out of mind, and that won't work. We must be involved. Well, how can we? Can you pray? Can we go to battle for those that are having to make decisions? We surely can. If we, if we can't battle in prayer, interceding on, on their behalf, you know what's kind of neat down at 32nd Street? Right across the street from that abortion clinic, there's been properties. That there is a prayer garden there with a little gazebo. And you know what people do? They go and sit in that gazebo, and as people are going into the, the clinic, guess what they're doing? They're praying on their behalf. Why? Because they care. Folks, we must care for God's heritage. We must be involved in prayer. How else can we be involved in prayer? Well, I've noticed many have picked up a baby bottle. Does that really help? Why don't you go and spend time and talk to the, the women and even some of the men that come into Hope Pregnancy Center that just thought that their world was being destroyed. Their walls were, were caving in. And they walked in just to get some information to see if they really trust me. You go talk to the ones that work at Hope Pregnancy Center and I've seen, I've seen it. They have a God. They said God does miracles in here. And the stories that you hear, the testimonies, I went in, I was thinking I wanted an abortion and I thought I was pregnant and I went in to see it. And I was in this room, and I looked up on the screen, and, and there was a heartbeat. They told a story of a 
granddaughter that came in with her grandma. Grandma was all for the abortion. And they were in that doctor room. She was sitting in the chair and on the screen was the baby that God had formed inside of her. Was the circumstances right? No. But God had formed a baby in, inside of her. And on that screen, there's that heartbeat. They tell the testimony that the grandma said, come on, let's go. That's just stuff. And the granddaughter turned to her and said, Grandma, stuff don't have a heartbeat. And she walked out of there determined to keep that baby and do her best to raise that baby. We can get involved with the heritage of God. Hope not only is physics saving babies, but men and women that have no hope are finding Jesus Christ through the process. How can we help? You know, we can fill those bottles. That's a small thing for us that has eternal dividends for others. We can pray, but we must stand and defend. But here's the other thing we see in our text this morning is that we must develop the children of God. Why? Because they're a heritage. They're a gift. God has entrusted them to us. Look how Solom Solomon describes them as arrows. Now what happens if you try to shoot a, a crooked arrow? What's going to happen? It's not going to go very far. You're going to have to do some extra work to, to, to make that, that arrow fly. But, but Solomon uses the picture that children not only are a gift, but they are, they, they're like an arrow. And a good marksman, archer, constantly works with his arrows, doesn't he? He wants to make sure that they are straight. He wants to make sure that, that the tail feathers... All right, listen, if they're not right, it's not going to go cut through the air the right way. He's going to make sure that that arrowhead is sharp. He's going to constantly work on it to, for it to, to accomplish uh, the job that it's supposed to do. In the same way, children are to be constantly checked. As we teach, why? It's just like the arrow. So it goes farther. So it goes straighter. And in doing so, look what Solomon says. They are a blessing to the one who carries the quiver. In Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. Listen, he doesn't leave any room for it if I feel like it, or when it's convenient. He says, with everything... And these words which I've commanded thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them. What are they supposed to teach? They are to teach God. What God expects, what God wants. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou layest down, and when thou risest up, and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thy head, and they shall be as frontless between their eyes, and, and they shall write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates. 
Moses uses that word diligently, not when we feel like it. It's work. Parents, grandparents, children are work. Amen? Oh, come on. You know I, I'm not the only one that's going to say amen. It's work. You're taking them one what place, right? You're taking them another place. You want to make sure they're doing right here and doing here and doing here. And, and there's times where you just want to sit down and just, oh, can I go any farther? I don't think I can go any longer. We've all been there. It is work. But listen, the following the Lord is work. Following the Lord isn't easy. They are our heritage because God has plans for them. And we are to diligently, not when we just feel like it, but constantly be teaching and exemplifying them. The church, here's the, the church is commissioned to do what? Preach the gospel to what? To all nations. Teaching them to observe all things. Guess what? That includes our very own. It's so easy to look at the exotic. Forget what is right here in front of us. We get excited about the mission field and missionaries come and they talk about some faraway place that needs Jesus and, and, and we get excited about that and we're, we're, we're willing to even send money and get involved but then a lot of times we forget about what's right at home Not only as families, as fathers and mothers, we must stand and, and teach. But listen, churches have been commissioned to preach the gospel. All ages must be on our minds. Children need to be an important part of the evangelism and outreach program. If we're to develop uh, the children of God, we must be developed children of God. If we want to teach them about prayer, guess what? They must see prayer in us. If we want to talk to them about faith, guess what? They must see that we're, we're people of faith. If we want to teach them about giving, guess what? They must see it being done in our lives. We want to talk about service. They must see us serving the Lord. We want to talk about worship. They must see us worship. Do you realize that we, were, we are worship, worshiping beings? That's how we've been created. We were created in, in, in the eyes or in the image of God, and, and we were created to be worshiping beings. That there is an, an innate thing inside of us that God has, has placed in us. That we are, since we are worshiping beings, we're going to worship something. We are. Well, that's how we're created. And if young people aren't taught how to worship, and if they don't see worship, guess what? They're going to worship something. Talking about faithfulness. They must see faithfulness in us. Listen, if God isn't number one in our life, it's a good chance that God's not going to be number one in the children that God has entrusted to us lives. That's plain and simple. Can God work around that and they make the decision? Yes. But God has entrusted to us to what? To raise them, raise them, train them, so that they can 
going into the world for the sake of the gospel. But here's what's so amazing about God. That God's a God of grace. You know, one of the things I, I don't, if you want to know about our men's Bible study, then men, you need to come to it if you can. One thing that it, it seems that we'll talk about everything in, in the verses that we're looking at, and the, the wagon always seems to, to circle back to this fact that, man, we see how God deals disciples and, you know, or, or different people, and boy, we feel guilty. That we don't. But guess what? God's and God. That's part of our conversation over and over is God's grace in our lives. You know, we can see and we can hear a message on bringing up children, and and maybe you're here and you're thinking, you know what? <laughs> My children are long gone. Boy, I, I, you know, based on scripture, I, I messed up. Maybe you, you're in it right now, and you're thinking, I, I'm, <laughs> I, I'm making a mess of it right now. You know, maybe you're watching this morning, and you're thinking, oh, uh, there is no hope. The same thing that we say to those that need Jesus, God's grace. It's not about our past, and it's not about our present, but it's about God's grace. You may be in a place in your life where children are out, they're gone. That job hasn't changed. There are those that you can still be pouring into. They will you. Will you find that one? That, that, is, uh, that needs that godly influence today. God's grace still uses. He doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. Will you listen to him speak this morning? Let's pray. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you. We thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for the gifts that you have given us. You are so gracious and so loving. Lord, many times we do depend on our own selves and it gets us in trouble. Chaos ensues. Lord, help us to, to depend on you. Lord, may we stand in the gap and defend life. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and life life goes against everything that Christ says but as we teach we see your grace and Lord I, I thank you for your forgiveness I thank you for your grace that you give us I thank you for your mercy Lord help us to grab hold of that grace in Jesus Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Would you please stand as we prepare for a song of response. How will you respond this morning? Will you stand for the heritage that God gives us? Are you into to those there's children, there's grandchildren. There are those without mothers and fathers that need that influence. Will you be that one as, as the Holy Spirit moves in?
religious heritage? Will you trust him this morning? Will you trust him that he can use you, that he wants to use you, that he will use you? Yeah. 